um, Dr. Craig Venter from the Venter Institute. Um, I think it's not necessary to present uh, uh, him in detail. He is, uh, as it says here, founder and chairman of the Venter Institute, but uh, he, um, <laughs> twice named as the 100 most influential people, that's right. But uh, as I see it, Craig's two most important contributions to science was uh, when he developed technology, nucleic acid technology, known as the shotgun method, to uh, rapidly sequence very large uh, genomes, including the human genome. Uh, against the, um, the, what was generally considered uh, the political best way uh, to do this. And the second important contribution was when he demonstrated how it's possible to use uh, a bacterial cell for installing a, a completely synthetic genome. Uh, I take the liberty to envisage that this latter application of the, uh, the gene technology may become in the future the medicinal laboratory in which you could um, do experiments uh, on a living system which is reduced to the most simple system you could uh, think of. And as you know, the cell is so extremely complex, so reduction is very important. So please, Craig, welcome. Well, Bent, uh, thank you not only for the kind introduction, but for the uh, invitation and the strong encouragement to uh, come to Singapore. Uh, so it's nice to be back here and see uh, friends and colleagues. Sort of build on uh, some of the themes that, uh, that Bent mentioned. Um, this is a unique time in human history. It's a, it's a time where our future as a species and a, on our planet is now 100% dependent on science. It's not an option anymore. Uh, it's critical for our future. So I'm gonna take you through uh, the world of genomics and give some ideas how it might contribute to some things in the future. If I, if I could have the first slide, here we go. Um, and all these, uh, the slides have been uh, formed on a PC and badly translated by Macintosh, so it's still uh, the limits of technology are, uh, are with us everywhere, uh, which is not a great message for trying to uh, define the future. Um, this is a, a picture of uh, the new building we're building in San Diego on the University of California San Diego campus. It's gonna be the first zero carbon uh, research building, so it's gonna generate all its own uh, power and it's going to uh, Recycle it, all its waste. If you want to come there and have a drink of water, we'd be happy to host you. Uh, we're having trouble getting permits from the city of San Diego to let people drink the water, but I, I will show you as time goes on that uh, it's going to be uh, uh, safe and exciting. So one of the reasons that uh, I think young people relate to this new field of synthetic biology is it's the ultimate interface between the biological world and the digital world. And we've, when we started reading genomes, we've taken what I call a, an analog molecule, DNA, with its four-letter code, and we can convert that into the ones and zeros in the computer uh, simply by reading that code. And we've been doing that essentially since 1977 uh, when the first uh, viral uh, genome was sequenced uh, by uh, Sanger and his colleagues. But now the challenge is to keep the slides. Um, <laughs> they, they disappear in a heartbeat. If I could have the slide back, please. It went to Korea. <laughs> there, it came back already. Uh, 
The challenge is now to go the other way, of starting with these ones and zeros in the computer, see if we can regenerate the analog molecule of life and regenerate life out of that. So let me wander uh, through this uh, time course of these events. Obviously, it started before, uh, uh, boy, these are really washing out, um, uh, before 1995, starting with random methods uh, for sequencing DNA. These were applied to the first genome in 1995 uh, by simply shattering the DNA, sequencing it, and using computational methods to put it back together. So even getting the first genome sequenced depended heavily on the computer and new comp computational uh, approaches. Five years later, after this first genome, we had the first draft of the human genome, uh, going from 1.8 million letters to over 3 billion letters for the uh, first haploid uh, a genome. And then uh, seven years later, we had the first diploid genome. Uh, and it was a tremendous surprise to people how different having uh, the view of both sets of chromosomes was. We found that we differed from each other by one to three uh, percent, not one out of a thousand. Uh, and this has continued to change our thinking going forward. And you're going to hear there's tremendous progress in DNA sequencing now. Uh, what took us nine months to do with the first human genome can now be done in an afternoon with a new ion torrent machine in about two hours for about $1,000 instead of $100 million or $5 billion. But sequencing more genomes has almost zero value either for, other than tracking uh, human populations unless we can find a way to digitize all human phenotypic information. And I think that's the biggest challenge for the biological and medical part of this field is how to digitize human phenotypes, even describing a human phenotype. Think about writing down everything about your life, uh, all your chemistry, uh, all that's known about your biology, your history of diseases, uh, your current ways of processing uh, materials, processing information, how your brain works. We have to digitize all of that so we can compare it to the genome, and we need to do that a minimum of 10,000 times. Doing it five times, 10 times. Um, people had the silly notion after we sequenced the genome for the first time, there was no point in doing any other genomes. You will see within your lifetimes that not only will your genome be sequenced, it will be sequenced probably 10 to 100 times. I'll show you in a few minutes, it's critical for stem cells, it's critical for uh, understanding cancer, it's understanding uh, your future development. So it's not a one-time thing. We've been advancing this by trying to get to haplotype phase variation, which is important. Everybody talks about what you inherited from your mother, what you inherited from your father, but we can't tell that at the DNA level unless we can separate the chromosomes back into those sets that you got from your mother and what you got from your father. One way we've been doing this, and it shows you how fast this field has advanced, we can sequence a human genome from a single cell. So sperm cells uh, are haploid, and we found uh, just by uh, isolating individual sperm cells that we could get uh, a phenotype and haploid uh, information, and by doing a half dozen or so sperm cells, we can get a complete haplotype phase of variation on an individual. And, Sequencing is so fast and so cheap now, uh, it's very quick to do this. There's only a, an average of one crossover per human chromosome uh, in each individual sperm. People thought there were going to be a lot more crossover events. So just by doing a few sperm, you can get uh, totally linear hap haplotype information. Sequencing uh, for diversity and understanding human populations is still important even without the phenotypic information. Uh, Vanessa Hayes uh, at the Venter Institute has been doing this, uh, sequencing some of the earliest populations in Africa. She did the Bushman genome. Uh, she did Desmond Tutu's genome. And when we compare this and, and to the nice work from the BGH, uh, doing the first Han Chinese genome, the Bushman genome, comparing it to my genome, everything comes across in this 1% to 3% human variation. However, when we look in Africa, and Vanessa's team is traced back to the earliest lineages there, which is it's really critical. We all derive from people who migrated out of Africa. 
but some of those populations migrated back into Africa and intermixed. So human diversity is tremendous. In fact, the human diversity is greater within Africa than between Africans and any other uh, population. So understanding this diversity is key to the next stages, and I'm sure you'll hear from uh, Henry and others about this kind of diversity. Using the same sort of shotgun sequencing techniques that we developed for the first genome and for the first human genome, we tried it on microbial populations, and one of them we tried uh, developed what is now known as the human microbiome, just shotgun sequencing all the microbes uh, in the human gut. And so the microbiome is now one of the fastest areas of, of uh, biological uh, research. And what we found is in addition to our 22,000 or so human genes, we have about 10 million additional genes associated with us. And it doesn't matter how often or how much you wash your hands, you still have uh, about 200 trillion microbes associated with your bodies. You can't get rid of them. And so what do they do? And that's what this new study is. And we, turns out you can't understand human physiology without understanding what all these microbes are doing. And there's more and more diseases now being linked to changes in the microbiome, which is affected by your diet. It's affected by your environment. Uh, and major food companies now are even trying to see if they can target specifically changing the microbiome population to try and prevent obesity, trying to prevent uh, diabetes, uh, for example. And there's even cancers like esophageal cancer showing up with unique uh, microbiome uh, populations. We also did this with shotgun sequence in the oceans and other environments. Uh, we did a circumnavigation, uh, taking samples uh, every 200 miles around the globe. Uh, we've gone uh, to lots of environments and uh, sampling uh, throughout the Baltic Sea, the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, around Antarctica. Uh, and we found more diversity by orders of magnitude than anybody expected. Uh, we've doubled the number of genes known to science now five times. And so that's under an exponential growth. Over 95% of the genes in the databases known to science were discovered from the deck of a small sailboat. So it shows you all you need is a simple idea and going out and executing on it, and you can make more discoveries uh, than all scientists have in the past. An example is SAR-11 was thought to be a single microbe. It was the 11th microbe discovered in the Sargasso Sea, so SAR-11. It turns out when we did the shotgun sequence in the ocean, we found variants of this, literally tens of thousands of them, up to 50% variation in the sequence, even though the gene content is largely conserved through all uh, these related organisms. Now, you think you're different from a mouse or a rat, but you're only different by about 10% in your genome sequence. Here we have diversity up to 50% with the same gene order, but everybody thought this was a single species up until recently. We've now collected more and more of this data, so what people thought were single species are whole new taxa with thousands and thousands of, uh, of uh, participants in these new taxa. Some of these have only been defined, like SAR-86, the third most abundant taxa, uh, simply by doing uh, this type of ocean shotgun sequencing. Now, if we look at the accumulation of knowledge, uh, if you're looking for more mammalian genes, you probably won't find any. Sequencing everybody's genome uh, in this room won't discover uh, new human genes. Um, and it's true for the whole mammalian uh, world. But if we look anywhere else, if we look at plants, microbes, uh, yeast, fungi, we're still totally in this linear phase of discovery. You're going to have to work hard as students to not make discoveries. That's very different than what we were taught. When I went into biology, I was told it's going to be very difficult to come up with something new because biology was all known. And we go through these bottlenecks. That was the 1960s and 1970s. Now it's an embarrassment if you can't make major discoveries uh, on a continuous basis. We're not just discovering new members of known families. We're discovering new gene and protein families on a continuous basis, and these are growing in a linear fashion. 
We asked questions about minimal life. In 1995, when we sequenced the first genome, we also did another genome that year, uh, that of the smallest organism capable of self-replication. Uh, and this started asking uh, new questions. Uh, how many of these genes are essential for life? Uh, what's the smallest number of genes necessary for a complete self-replicating biological system? And then ultimately to answer these questions, could we design and construct a chromosome? Design and construct a living cell uh, to try and understand these issues. And as soon as we went down that road, it brought up all kinds of uh, new issues. For example, with chemistry, would chemistry even permit making large DNA molecules? And if we could, could we do anything with them? Could we activate them? Could we boot them up? So this work started in 1995. We took a couple years off to sequence the human genome, and then got back to this in earnest. And my colleagues in this, uh, it's hard to read uh, these slides, but it was Ham Smith uh, and Clyde Hutchinson. Ham Smith uh, got the Nobel Prize in 1978 for discovering restriction endonucleases, and this is part of his uh, second or third career. We started with Phi X174, the bacteriophage that kills E. coli, and also it was the first DNA virus to have its genome sequenced. So we chose this for historical purposes, and also it was known that it can't tolerate many mutations, so we thought it would be a robust test of getting accurate uh, chemical synthesis. And think of, you know, uh, Bent mentioned chemistry. Uh, we're following the lines of what chemists have done. Uh, when chemists determine a structure, they have to go back and synthesize that chemical and prove that it has the properties of what they thought they were determining the structure of. We're now following that same line only with uh, DNA. So we started with the digital code in the computer and four bottles of chemicals and made this 5,000 base pair genome. And then we injected that into E. coli. E. coli recognized the synthetic DNA as normal DNA and started making proteins. The protein self-assembled to form the virus, and the virus showed its gratitude by killing the cells that made it. Uh, it's a paradigm for the biotech industry. Um, and the way we detect this is with these clear uh, plaques on, uh, clear spots on a plate. So we call this a situation where the software builds its own hardware. Software is DNA, the hardware in this case is the viral particle that didn't exist until we put that software program uh, into the cell. But we didn't want to just make uh, viruses. Uh, that's now pretty simple and straightforward to do. Uh, but we knew if we could make viral sized pieces completely accurately, that, that we could maybe make a lot of those, put those together, and have a complete bacterial chromosome. So we started down this route that looks uh, sort of like a Final Four uh, playoff in basketball. Uh, and nothing was known about the largest piece of DNA that had been made chemically uh, was 30,000 base pairs, and that was only recently uh, into this work. So we started with viral-sized pieces around 5 to 6 KB. We put four of those together to get 24 KB pieces, and we cloned these in E. coli. Uh, and isolated the DNA, sequenced it to see if it was stable, see if these constructs uh, were going to work. We then went on to the next stage. We used that purified DNA uh, to make 72,000 base pair pieces. So at that stage, uh, everything that was uh, at the 72,000 base pair what was a new world record uh, for DNA synthesis. Again, we cloned these in E. coli, isolated it, sequenced it, made sure that the clones were stable. And then went on to the next stage, put two of those together to get pieces that were 144,000 base pairs. And at this stage, we started to get into trouble with things cloning in E. coli with this synthetic DNA. So we looked around uh, uh, for a, a new uh, cloning vector, and we decided to use Saccharomyces cerevisiae because it, we found it can take very large pieces of DNA, in fact, up to uh, 12 megabases, uh, and it has a very powerful homologous recombination system, meaning that it can put pieces together and recombine those in an effective fashion. We found if we took four of the quarter genome molecules designed with the right overlaps, put them into yeast, 
with a vector that has just a synthetic yeast centromere in it, that yeast would automatically assemble all these pieces together and give us the entire bacterial chromosome. And that's what we reported in 2008 uh, with the uh, first <laughs> chemical synthesis of a bacterial chromosome. And in 2008, this was the largest chemical structure of a defined nature uh, made uh, by humans. The chemistry continued to be perfected. We hired a young postdoc named da Dan Gibson, who's now been with us uh, quite a while, who made a really nice breakthrough uh, by getting these complex enzymatic reactions in a single test tubes that works uh, at a single temperature. So this totally changes what can happen with synthesis uh, because we can now just throw synthesized oligonucleotides into this test tube uh, and it assembles them into the much larger pieces, which means we can now automate this process. So we can go from the digital world into large DNA molecules without much human intervention. Uh, which means we can start to scale to the next level. And we've been working, uh, it's a shame all these slides are so washed out, but uh, uh, I don't know if the uh, projector can be toned down a little bit uh, so people can see these, but uh, we're automating the entire process now, uh, trying to get so we can make first entire genomes in a day, then thousands of genomes in a day, then millions of genomes in a day. And we're trying to do this with an automated self-learning system. Imagine, we're close to 100 million genes that we've discovered in the environment. Uh, the way science has proceeded with individual scientists studying gene functions, sometimes for their entire career, uh, we're, we're gonna need a few million years to characterize all the genes that have already been discovered, unless we can find an automated uh, very complex way to do this. So if we get a self-learning robot and we can build these constructs on a large scale, we can actually have a robot that could learn 10,000 times faster than any scientist can. And just think of what would happen to the progress of science if all of a sudden we accelerate it by 10,000 times and learning these functions. And we're just on the verge of being able to do this. Uh, we tested this initial uh, robotics just by assembling uh, the mouse mitochondrial genome with this single pot reaction. And now uh, SGI has licensed this out to New England Biolabs, so you can actually buy the Gibson assembly kit from New England Biolabs and uh, build your own uh, DNA constructs. So we had two teams, one working on the chemistry and another team working on the biology. Our biggest fear is we would solve the chemistry problem, but not the biology. So we had a team working to develop this new technique we're calling genome transplantation. In this paper we published in 2007 in Science, I, I think is one of the most profound of all the uh, breakthroughs that I've been privileged to be involved with, because this tells us more about biology than almost anything else. And with this study, we replaced the DNA software in a cell and completely converted one species into another. Even though our computers can't do that, I put in PCs, uh, PowerPoint slides into this and they didn't get translated so well into Macintosh world. We can do that biologically. We can convert the equivalent of a PC into a Mac simply by putting in new software. So let me uh, walk you through this because I think this is an important part of understanding the future of synthetic genomics. So what we did is we uh, isolated a, the genome, the entire chromosome, from one bacterial species, M. mycoides. And we treated it harshly. We treated it with proteinases to destroy all the proteins. Because think, if we're trying to work in a digital world and just make chemicals, we wanted to make sure we could use naked DNA to boot up new life forms. If there were proteins that had to be involved for booting them up, this whole field would be a lot more complicated. We also added uh, two cassettes to it, one so that we could select for that chromosome, and two, uh, another one so that it would turn cells bright blue uh, if that chromosome was activated. And we developed new techniques for moving chromosomes around. You can't pipette these like you do normal molecules, because the DNA is so big, large DNA becomes fragile. 
So we have to move it around in gel blocks, moving it in and out of the gel blocks with electric current. And we develop ways to transplant that chromosome into a recipient cell, in this case, M. capricolum, which is roughly the same distance apart that we are from mice, around 10 or 11 uh, percent. So we have this movie, I don't know if it will show up here to show you what we think happened. Uh, it sort of does. We inserted the mycoides chromosome into the capricolum cell. And now we have a cell with a characterized phenotype uh, a unique species, but now it has two sets of operating software in it. So what do we think happened? Just as with the, uh, the viral DNA going into E. coli, that DNA started to be read in the first few seconds that it went into the cell. It made a lot of proteins. Some of the early proteins it made were restriction enzymes. Those restriction enzymes recognized the Capricolum chromosome as foreign DNA and chewed it up. So now we have the body and the cytoplasm of one species and the DNA software of another. So what happened next? We ended up with these bright blue cells, and when we interrogated them, there wasn't a single molecule left of the original species. Everything in the cell derived from the chromosome that we transplanted into it. So simply by changing the software, the whole Capricolum species characteristic disappeared, and whatever the chromosome we put in dictated what the cell was. So life is a DNA software system. You change the software, you change the species. And this is a very different view of biology uh, than we've had before. Now some of you recognize perhaps that we have a unique problem. We are assembling the synthetic DNA in a eukaryotic cell. So we have a bacterial chromosome in a eukaryotic cell. So to transplant it, we had to find a way to get it out of the yeast cell to transplant into the bacteria. So we developed all kinds of new techniques for cloning bacterial chromosomes in yeast cells. And now we can clone a range of bacterial chromosomes in yeast simply by adding an artificial yeast centromere. Maybe the whole difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic chromosomes is this centromere. Uh, these genomes uh, grow stably, they get copied and transplanted, uh, uh, transmitted along with all the yeast chromosomes uh, to their progeny. So now we have a system where we could test taking the chromosome out of yeast and transplanting it. And the problem is when we did this, it didn't work. And I view science is mostly problem solving. And we had uh, more than our share of problems that we had to solve with this whole field of synthetic uh, genomics. This problem took us two and a half years to solve. And the irony is, uh, the answer to this was restriction endonucleases, even though we had the man who discovered them uh, on our team, it took us a while to do this. It turns out in the bacterial cell, when we isolated the chromosome for the initial transplantation experiments, that DNA was methylated. And that methylation protected it from the restriction enzymes from the capricolum chromosome in the cell. And we proved this by isolating all the restriction enzymes from the mycoides cell. And if we then took the DNA out of yeast and methylated it, all of a sudden we could get transplants. And we proved this by remaking the chromosome in the capricolum cell, leaving out the restriction enzymes. In that case, we could transplant naked DNA out of yeast. So we published a study in 2009 in science where we had this complete cycle now that's actually a very, very powerful technique set on its own. Simply by adding the synthetic yeast centromere to a bacterial chromosome, we can now clone that chromosome in yeast. So what's the advantage of that? People work on E. coli mostly because they can, not because they want to. Most bacteria do not have genetic systems, uh, so you can't change their genomes or do anything with them. But simply by cloning that bacterial chromosome in yeast as now a eukaryotic chromosome, we can make infinite numbers of modifications of that chromosome using the yeast genetic systems. So we go through all kinds of modifications, isolate the chromosome, methylate it if necessary, transplant it, and get a new species. 
So at this stage, we were sure that we had solved all the problems and we were now ready to do the genome transplant with the synthetic genome. And we decided because of all the progress in synthesis to go up a size and make the much larger mycoides genome, which was 1.1 million letters of genetic code. We did this simply by making 1KB pieces for the entire genome. We put 10 of those together to make 10KB pieces. We put 10 of those together to make uh, 100 KB pieces, and so we had 11 of those. We put those 11 100 KB pieces into yeast and assembled it to make the entire chromosome, and we did the transplantation, and it didn't work. Now, software engineers have debugging software. If you write software code and there's errors, you have software that can find where the errors are. We had to solve this problem, so we had to find a biological equivalent of debugging software. And we did this in this case by making corresponding pieces from the native mycoides genome. And we could substitute the native chromosome piece for the synthetic one. And we did this one at a time uh, and found we could do transplants. And we finally got up to 10 synthetic segments, but the final piece had to be uh, from the native genome. We had sequenced the whole genome with next generation technology, which has all these technologies have systematic errors. And so we went back and sequenced the one piece uh, with the older Sanger technology and found one base pair deletion in the DNA aging, which is an essential gene. One letter being wrong out of 1. million, 1.1 million base pairs, the difference between life and no life. We corrected that error, resynthesized the genome, did the transplant, and it worked. And so this is what we reported in 2010. This is the first species to have a computer as a parent. Its entire chromosome was designed in the computer, built from four bottles of chemicals. And as we know from doing the transplant, everything in the cell, every protein, every molecule in that cell is derived from what that chromosome coded for. So how did we know it was a synthetic chromosome? This is one of the problems we worried about the most from the beginning. What if we had just one molecule of native genome contamination? It could fool us into thinking that we had a synthetic cell and we didn't. So we invented this method of uh, watermarking the DNA uh, so that we could prove the difference between synthetic species uh, and native species. In fact, in the first genome, we just used the single letter amino acid code to write the scientists' names uh, in the genome. And that is not very satisfactory because it doesn't give you the, the complete alphabet. So we invented a whole new code um, that uh, and a lot of scientists use ASCII code. In fact, when we sent this paper to review in science, one of the reviewers sent the review back completely written in DNA code. Uh, the editor of science was very upset with this because she couldn't read it. Um, but we decoded it pretty quickly, and basically it was an ASCII code. And ASCII code's not a good code for DNA uh, unless you just want to write messages in it because you can create all kinds of new uh, proteins and peptides, perhaps new toxins. So we invented a new code that you can decode out of the uh, first watermark that puts in very frequent stop codons into anything you write, so we don't inadvertently create new biology. And with this, we can write the complete English language with uh, numbers and punctuation. And also, in the first watermark, there's a URL. Having a computer as a parent, we thought it was important for this a species born out of a computer to have its own web address. <coughs> And when we announced the genome, we didn't announce uh, what the uh, decoding was, and we set it up as a contest uh, to see how long it would take uh, uh, people around the world to decode uh, this new uh, code and read the rest of it. And if they did, they would send an email to the species, to the URL, and the genome. Uh, some did it quite quickly, but it took a, uh, accumulation. Once we got over 100 respondents, uh, it took a couple weeks. We then made uh, this public. So what the watermarks contain using this new code is the names of the 46 scientists involved in the project. And also we were told that in the first genome we weren't very creative. We didn't put in something like one small step for bacteria. Um, 
So I came up with three quotations from the literature. They're probably hard to read, so let me read them to you. The first one is from James Joyce, to live, to err, to fall, to triumph, to recreate life out of life. That, that seemed an appropriate quotation. The second is from American Prometheus, uh, Oppenheimer's biography. See things not as they are, but as they might be. And the third was from Richard Feynman, and it gets down to the essence of chemistry. What I cannot build, I cannot understand. And once this became public, uh, there, there was a lot of discussion on it, but the, one of the first responses we got was from a letter from James Joyce, a state attorney, uh, <laughs> saying that I had not asked permission to use that quotation. Uh, James Joyce was dead, so it was kind of hard to ask him. Um, but also, in, in the U.S., the fair use laws, you can quote a paragraph uh, without uh, permission from somebody. So we dismissed that one. And then we started getting emails from a Caltech scientist saying we had misquoted Richard Feynman. And this where it's dangerous to rely on the web, because this is the quotation you'll find uh, tens of thousands of copies of on the web. But to prove his point, the scientist sent us Richard Feynman's uh, blackboard with the original quotation, what I cannot create, I do not understand, which I think is actually a much better version. Uh, but one of his biographers uh, made uh, the translation error, I guess, and ended up with the one that's out there. So we've now corrected the genetic code so Richard Feynman can rest in peace. Um, but it shows you the power of what you can write into the genome. And it's not just for fun. It, it's essential that every synthetic species be clearly watermarked, or we will really confuse evolutionary scientists uh, uh, going uh, forward. So what can we do with this? Um, the number of genes keeps going up, uh, but the 60 to 100 million genes discovered to date, I like to think about them as design components, uh, the same way that uh, in the 40s and 50s and 60s, people had resistors and capacitors and transistors and integrated circuits to make basically everything we know in the electronics world. We have orders of magnitude more design components uh, than ever existed in anybody's imagination in the electronics world. So we actually have software at Synthetic Genomics for designing new DNA software for designing new species. And we're really putting this to the test right now, uh, a project between the Institute and Synthetic Genomics with the whole team. We're trying to see if we can actually design a minimal genome based on first principles of biology. And this is a huge, huge challenge because even in our minimal genome, there's 100 genes of unknown function. All we know is if we leave that gene out, the cell dies. So biology is very incomplete right now. Uh, but we're making our best guesses and we're designing uh, our most uh, aggressive genome, uh, which is less than half the size of the one we transplanted, and then one we're adding about 100 extra genes back. So we'll know in a while whether we can actually do this design completely de novo, uh, but also just building cassettes of things. We don't even know if you take all the same genes in a genome and put them in a different order can you get the same life form out of it? We're, we're trying to actually group things in a logical way on chromosomes. That's not how our chromosomes ended up, you know, from random processes. Uh, it was stunning early on when it was found even the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor that controls your muscle contraction. It has four subunits spread over four different chromosomes. There was no logic of there, here's an area for muscles, here's the area for heart. Uh, we're redesigning bacterial chromosomes in a logical fashion. Um, and we'll see uh, what that does to these processes. I don't know if you can see the last part here on control and safety. So this is one of the most important areas. We don't want new species that we're designing and building to be able to get out of the lab, get out of an industrial setting uh, uh, on their own. So we're trying to design a whole series of new cells to deal with some of the biggest problems on the planet, using our most abundant energy source, sunlight, and our most abundant carbon source, uh, carbon dioxide, to go into food, fuels, chemicals, uh, et cetera. 
Uh, and we're also doing this in the medical arena. So working with Novartis, with Reno uh, Rapali's team, we now have in Europe the first genome-based vaccine came on the market this year. It's the meningitis B. So kids, most of the audience age, uh, this is one of the uh, most dangerous diseases uh, affecting your age group because by the time you can diagnose this disease, it's too late. The only thing you can do is prevent it. And it gets into this whole notion of preventative medicine. So this was based on designing things from the genome that we sequenced a long time ago. It took 15 years because of doing clinical trials in infants to finally get it on the market. But we're now changing the time course and we've chosen influenza virus as the uh, source that we've decided to experiment with uh, for a new way to make vaccines. And my institute's been involved. It's the, one of the uh, major sites in the world for doing survey sequencing of flu virus from uh, people and animals from around the world. And we've been studying its genome and uh, its variation. And the goal is to predict what's going to happen in the future with the flu virus instead of what we've been doing, waiting until there's a new infection, working out what caused it, and then trying to make a vaccine for it. That just is not going to work. So we've worked on a way to accelerate this process from something that was taking months down to hours and days. And so we have a project with Novartis and with uh, the U.S. government. Uh, so the U.S. government sends us a test pandemic uh, viral sequence, and we have less than 24 hours to construct it. We actually have it down to 12 hours now, making it synthetically, totally from the synthetic DNA processes. We get it to Novartis, they rescue it. They have a multi-billion dollar facility in North Carolina that can produce uh, potentially enough vaccine for the world in a very short period of time. So we're pandemic ready and we're trying to get this now where it can be done with the annual flu. Here's an important equation when you think about the future. Fuel equals water equals food. And we have to solve every part of this equation. If we have abundant cheap energy, uh, we can produce clean water, we can produce food. They're all interrelated. And just think about with water, uh, it takes about 5,000 liters of water to produce the food that each of us consume every day. And we have new approaches for cleaning up water, just using these same microbes, using microbial fuel cells, uh, design processes, where we can take human waste streams, uh, uh, industry waste streams, and all the carbon in it gets metabolized. About 70% of all the fresh water use uh, in the world is used by agriculture. Agriculture is an old, ancient system that allowed uh, a civilization to expand, but it won't work in the future. And when we add on to that we're consuming uh, 75 million barrels of oil equivalents every day. We obviously can't keep doing this. There, there's not going to be a future if we keep taking this old biology out of the ground, burning it, and putting it in our atmosphere. So looking at plants and looking at agriculture, uh, a lot of the U.S. economy is down at the bottom. It's based on corn. Corn can only produce about 18 gallons per acre per year. The most productive plant that we know of on the planet is oil palm. And we work with uh, uh, Genting uh, teams in, in Malaysia to help them uh, sequence the oil palm genome. It can produce about 600 gallons per acre per year. But the, neither of those is good enough for the future. Uh, we think by using microalgae and synthetic cells, we can get to 10 to 15,000 gallons per acre per year. Basically eliminating agriculture as we know it, replacing it with industrial processes using sunlight and CO2. In fact, we have whole teams now working on making omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA, uh, by scaling up uh, algae production of these uh, to whole new scales and designing new proteins. The world's going to get very confused. I don't know how many of you are vegetarians, but in the not-so-distant future, animal proteins are going to be made in plants and algae. So is that going to be a vegetable 
uh, food or is that going to be a meat source? Uh, we need to eliminate cows and chickens and pigs as a source of producing food. It's not scalable and we're adding a billion people to the population of the planet every 11 to 12 years. Essentially the equivalent of all of China being added to the world every 12 years. Uh, and we can't feed the ones we have. Uh, this is a growing market as people discovering the health benefits of uh, these omega-3 fatty acids. And where do we get them now? From uh, massive fish, fish kills and pressing uh, the oil out of fish. People think it's fish oil and the, that fish smell fishy, but basically it's algae oil and uh, it only smells fishy when it's uh, oxidized and degraded a little bit. So if we can eliminate producing it from fish and produce it uh, from algae, uh, we can change the order of things. For engineering photosynthetic algae to greatly increase things, we're having to engineer hundreds and hundreds of parameters in these cells. Everything from changing their photoreceptors, changing how photosynthesis works, changing how the carbon fluxes throughout the cells. These are huge engineering problems, only they're all happening in the micro world uh, not on the large scale, but we're testing it uh, on larger and larger scales. This is our greenhouse in La Jolla, uh, where we're testing a variety of different systems once we make them. And then we have uh, an 80 acre facility uh, out in the California desert uh, for testing things on larger scales. To close, when we went down the synthetic route, not only were technical challenges, but society challenges. And before we even started the first experiment, I asked for a bioethical review uh, because I knew we were in uncharted territories designing and making new species. Uh, the University of Pennsylvania took this on and they published their results in 1999. Uh, there's been lots of studies since. Uh, the Sloan Foundation funded my institute along with MIT and uh, uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington to do a couple year long review on the, uh, uh, some of the security impacts of this. And then when we announced uh, in 2010 our first synthetic cell, President Obama asked his new bioethics commission to take this on as their number one study. They did, they published this report in December of 2010. And if you're interested in this field, you should go uh, to the government websites and download this, because it's actually a really superb study uh, for a uh, a government review group, talking about the tremendous potential of basically in creating a whole new industrial revolution, changing agriculture, changing everything as we know it, but also the danger sides of this. This is very powerful technology that only takes one or two people to do things uh, that it used to take armies to do. And so they're trying to achieve the right balance uh, and uh, work out whether new laws and regulations are needed. So in summation, we can go from this long period in science of getting up to being able to read the genetic code to for the first time being able to write the genetic code. And that writing the genetic code is over the next decade or so going to change so dramatically uh, with new techniques and new automation. Look at the changes in DNA sequencing going from billion dollar projects down to a few thousand dollar project, going from 15 years down to two hours. DNA synthesis is just starting to get going. And once we can make millions of chromosomes a day cheaply at a variety of sites around the world, we will start to solve some of the empirical problems of biology just by being able to do very, very large numbers of experiments. Thank you very much.